Got it. For a minute there, I didn't think the microphone was going to work. I was going to have to yell or something. <clears throat> I don't want to yell right now. For the past uh, almost a week, I've been fighting the cough. I even went home early Friday, called in sick Saturday. I was up at 5 o'clock this morning because I was supposed to preach for a congregation in Zambia at 6. Keep, keep, the, keep the Christians in Lakusa. Uh, no, is that right? The capital. I think I got it pronounced wrong. Anyway, Zambia, because I tried three different times to call uh, and it, it did not go through. So I don't know what's going on. And we've been, we were planning this for, for over a month. Uh, so anyhow, uh, that said, our congregation's Facebook page has 1,234 followers. And so it's, it's slowly, slowly growing. And a lot of it is, a lot of that growth has been in Africa for some reason. So maybe it has something to do with the help we've been uh, sending to the orphanage there in Uganda. Maybe other reasons, I don't know. But anyway, keep them in prayer. I appreciate Paul's uh, choice of songs that uh, song just a moment ago reminded me of a passage the blood of Jesus it was singing about and it used uh, that song there had a text from Hebrews chapter 9 but I want to read this one it was one that we uh, touched upon in our class there with the young adults and uh, this is Hebrews chapter 13 says, beginning in verse 11, it says, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hence, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. And you might be thinking, okay, wait a second, because the title of our ser my, the sermon today is Parenting. This was one of the requests that, uh, that uh, folks had put on the 3 by 5 cards I passed out about a month or so ago. And, um, and I thought, you know, parenting, holy smokes. This really isn't a topic that can be covered in one Sunday morning, let alone a whole month of Sunday mornings, because there's so much involved. You know, where, where do you begin? Where do you go? You know, I don't want to be going to passages like we have in Ephesians, where it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Uh, because when you go to passages like that, are you focusing on the parenting or are you focusing on? the children and their behavior. I don't know that you, you can really separate the two because what is parenting, if not modifying your children's behavior to such a degree that they fully understand at some point in their life the depth of the sacrifice of Christ. That's why we raise our kids, because we want our children to come to know Christ on their own. We want them to have a faith of their own. We want them to be able to make those uh, kinds of holy choices. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that will benefit them in the long term. But sometimes this can be a uh, a frustrating endeavor. That said, I want to share this little anecdote. Roger Rapart, he writes, Did you know? That there is, I don't know what a chain letter is. Okay, I can, I can continue then. There is a special chain letter written specifically to parents. It reads, Dear friend, this chain letter is meant to bring relief and happiness to you. 
Unlike other chain letters, this one does not cost money. Simply send a copy of this letter to six other parents who are tired of their teenagers. Then bundle up your teenager and send him or her to the parent at the bottom of the list. In one week, you will receive 16,436 teenagers, one of whom is bound to work in your family. All right. Of course, one dad broke the chain and got his own kid back. Anyhow, it's funny, but it kind of illustrates. I, you know, and at really, when I was reading this, I was thinking of my parents when I was a teenager. Because I was definitely one who uh, pushed the limits of parental frustration to such a degree that when I came home one day and said, I'm joining the Marine Corps, my stepdad, or, my stepdad this was the exact quote, good, where's the paper so I can sign him? I was a minor at the time, and he knew that he would have to sign the papers, and he was ready, willing, able, and anxious to sign said paperwork. Yes, I was quite the frustration to my parents. There's another story, not so much anecdotal as it illustrates a necessity of wise parenting. I watched a video. She had to be about five years old. Thrust open a car door. She's all bundled up. She blurts out with who the blankety blank are you? And about that moment, she saw who was sitting in the driver's seat. She says, oh, I love you. You can hear mom in the background. What did you say? I love you. I don't think that's what you said. I love you. Now, I point this out specifically because I want you to catch something. This child, with whatever was going on in her home, in her home life, which would cause her to learn the first phrase that she came out with, that's obviously wrong and needs correction. But what I found interesting was she knew at five years old what things are right to say and what things are wrong to say. That is why parenting is so very, very important. However frustrating it can be, however problematic it can be at times, with whatever tears it brings, uh, it brings a lot of happiness, a, a lot of cheer, a lot of joy. Uh, I, I, I've told you this before, but, you know, if I had it to do all over again, there's some things that would not change, but there's some things that I might have done a little bit different. Um, I don't know if that would have made a better outcome, but I know what information my sons have, and that information is theirs to make use of. Um, and, so, and, and I will still encourage those kinds of decisions because that's what a parent does. All right. This, this, the passage that I want to read at this point, uh, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter six. I, I would like you to turn there, Deuteronomy chapter six, because parenting is such an important role that God t 
teaches it as requiring a persistent dedication, a persistent attention, right? It's something we, you know, we just, the kids, you know, they'll, really? I've heard this a hundred times, Dad. That's right. You might hear it a hundred times more, you know. But the passage, it begins in, uh, uh, I want to read, uh, you're in chapter 6, flip over to chapter 4 real fast, I'm sorry. Chapter 4, I, run, I want to read verses 7 through 9, then we'll go to chapter 6. But it says here, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Now let's skip over to chapter 6, and then we can pick up with verse 4. <coughs> Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which, which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down. And when you rise up. And so the question that I would have there in verse 7 to begin with is, is there any point, is there any time during the day when it's not a good time to teach your son and daughter about things that matter to God? It's just all the time. It's, it's always there. It's, I think it's good to keep that in perspective with the amount of information that is thrust upon us. Um, I know I like watching these traffic videos, whether it's road rage or karma, car crashes or bad decisions in snowy weather. I just like watching vehicles. There was this one I watched. It was a particularly, everybody was okay, but it was a, it was a nasty enough wreck that uh, there were cars turned over. And what I thought was interesting was this hand that came out of the vehicle as he's pushing up the sideways turn truck. He pushes it open, and in this hand, he's got his phone. I, could have been a number of reasons, you know. Um, was he finishing watching the video that he was watching prior to the wreck? I, I'm just tossing that out there. I'm sure that it had something to do with wanting to maybe call somebody in an emergency situation. But it illustrates we always have that thing. Are you? How often are you separated from it? We have it so... We have our phone so often. Do you know that there's this new box that's going around on uh, uh, different social pages? Um, and, and on this box, it has our family name, whatever it is. Uh, and, and we are phone-free in this house. And however many people are in this house, they have a they have sections in this box. And so this picture was when you're in the home, basically when you're in the house, there were six phones in that box. 
So when you come in a house, that's where they go. And it's, it, it's pointing out that our attachment to that thing is so great that now we have to focus on how to get it out of our hand. I said all that to say this. We have so much information at our hands now. I think that it makes it even more important for parents to be interjecting those holy concepts, those holy ideas, those holy thoughts to help our kids to maintain a holy path. The rest of the lesson for us today, it's really just a bunch of questions. And, and, and well, I just give you the first one. How many kids should we have? Right? Mom and dad, newlywed, they sit down, you know, and they're planning their life together. You know, they've had the wedding, they've gone, uh, they're, they're, they're entering into their, their marriage, and uh, they've had, They've already had some of these conversations. Hopefully, they've had these conversations prior to the wedding. But now that they are in the marriage, it's good to affirm some of those things. And so, how many kids are we going to have? I'm going to stop right there before you say, A, B, C, D, whatever, one, two, three, four. Uh, because that ain't really up to you. When you really think about it, it is God who gives us our children. I have personally visited with people who have been told they will never have children, and now they have kids. Um, I know people that have said, the contraception ain't working anyway. So what do they do? Stop using contraception, and now they got twins. Um, you get the you get the picture, though, right? I want to I want to I want to throw in a passage here. God does not give us more than we can handle. Okay, so. <clears throat> Um, if you've got a lot of kids, God has a lot of faith in you to bring up faithful children. If, if you don't have a lot of kids, He's wanting you to focus specifically on that child for specific reasons that He alone knows. Maybe until such time, He decides to let you have another kid if that's what you want. How many kids should we have? It's okay to plan, but when your plans don't exactly come out, know that God is in control and thank Him anyway. Okay? When our children go, uh, grow up, what will they be or do? Um. <clears throat> Some parents, parents micromanage their kids to such a degree that they have them doing all kind of things at a very young age because they see that child in their early 20s as being what they in their mind think that child ought to be. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, that kind of an education. It's structured. Uh, it can be beneficial. It can be good. Um, but if the child grows up and chooses a different path that throws away all of your dreams for that child over the past 18, 19, whatever years, be prepared for it. Be prepared for it. Um, 
the main thing that we need to keep in mind when we read those passages from Deuteronomy in, in chapter 4 and in chapter 6, neither one of those texts said to raise your children up to be a bricklayer, raise your child up to be a chef, raise your child up to whatever. They said, raise your child to be faithful to God. If you focus on that first, even though you had all these dreams for that child, you put all of this money into whatever music, language, whatever kind of education, you know, you put all that time in, making sure that they did their practice and all of that kind of stuff, whatever. And they grow up and make a different choice. That's completely, completely something you never thought they would choose. Ask them, is that going to affect your faithfulness to God? If they say no, then give them your blessing. Uh, let's turn to uh, the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. I, th I think this is an important uh, concept to share regarding parenting. In Luke chapter 2, verse 27, then I'm going to skip over and read 41 through 43. But it, <coughs> excuse me, Luke 27 says, he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child to carry out for him the custom of the law, and then it continues going on. And, and of course, the, Jesus was brought into the temple by his parents to carry out customs. Okay, uh, 41 through 43, it reads thus, thusly, and his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, when he became twelve, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents were unaware of it. Parents, plurals, mentioned in three passages in two different situations. And, and the point here is, both of these situations are major events in a child's life. Major events. And I, I, th I think that it's good for us to take from here, and it kind of leads into the next question, take from here that when it comes to the major events that are taking place within a child's life, it might be a good idea to have both parents involved. So the next question how important is it to show a unified front? We know from our example of the five-year-old that kids are intelligent. If, par if a child learns that his parents are not always unified on the decisions about bringing them up, that child will quickly learn to pit one parent against the other quickly. And that's, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing. Be unified in, 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 your, in your parenting. Are there techniques, different types of parenting for different age groups? I would have to say, yeah. And I would have to say that they might even be different depending upon that individual. You know, I, th I think one of the things that Sherry and I learned raising the boys is that we could use one technique for one of the boys. It did not necessarily work well or even at all when we employed that same thing with one of the other boys. And so we, we learned to use different methods. Uh, with the boys, you know, and, and so it something, something to keep in mind. And, and you should know, you probably already got it figured out. These questions that I'm putting forth, they kind of open up a whole bag, uh, a whole bag of, uh, 
questions, you know, that lead down other tracks, you know. That's why I said this really isn't a subject that we can cover with any great depth in, in, in one Sunday, you know. Um, would I want my children to be proud of who they are and where they come from? Um, I hope so. Heritage is important. I am a third generation American. My great, great grandparents came over from uh, Europe as Russians and Germans. And, and uh, it's good for my boys to know that. My dad, we kind of did a family thing, and, and our family, years and years back, actually had a crest. And so uh, my boys have that. Actually, Adam has, has that. I need to get that back from that whippersnapper. Uh, but he had that tattooed on his back. It's large. Covers his covers his back. Heritage is a good thing. There is no greater heritage than to say to your children, I am my father's son. And I'm not talking about Gordon Allen. I am talking about Father God. That is a lasting heritage. I have, as a result of that, a family larger than any could imagine. I have brothers and sisters all over the world, as well as you. There isn't a place we can go and not have a bed. Because when we find a brother or sister in Christ and say, Hey, I need a place to sleep, they will say, Here you go. How do you keep your marriage strong with, ne with the new demands of children? That is entirely up to you how you do that. You know, there's a lot to consider there. But I beg you, husbands and wives, keep your marriage strong. It is one of the best gifts that you can give to your children. Okay? Who do you listen to with all the parenting advice that is given? There's a lot of parenting advice. You can't swing a dead cat, as the proverbial saying goes, without finding somebody to give you some advice how to raise kids. What it boils down to is, here's the first place. Here's the first place. This has the theology behind it. There are even passages where you can go to find some practicality. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. All right? I don't know why that's not given mothers. I, I, I here To illustrate it this way, there is a radio guy that I listened to. He recently got married. He and his wife don't have kids yet, but they went out and bought a puppy. And so they're trying to train this puppy. His way of dealing with the puppy is to come home after work and wrestle with the dog. And she says, you can't be doing that. It makes her rambunctious and uncontrollable. Right? And so he's learning. Well, how do you phrase it? My wife is training me to train the puppy. Yeah. Maybe it's because dads like to do that kind of stuff and wrestle with the kids, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But be sensitive, dads. Be wise. Watch for that point when your child may be getting to the point where they've had enough. And don't exasperate them. Let them be the ones to pin you, all right? <clears throat> what do you do when you have... Made a bad parenting decision. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you do when you've made a bad parenting decision? <clears throat> K 
kids need to see uh, some frailty in their parents. They need to see them say, hey, uh, I, I, did, I was not exactly wise in this choice, and, and here's why it's not wise. Here's the kind of damage that it could have caused you, uh, could have caused us in our togetherness, however that is, whatever that decision may have been. You know, and, and, and kids need to see uh, grace in operation, those kinds of things. Um, some decisions can't be overturned. Sometimes you don't see that you've made a bad decision till years later. You know, have those conversations if you know if 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 the situation arises, that kind of thing. One more story, and I'll leave the the parenting stuff uh, in in your lap. An 87 year old man. He was standing before a judge for speeding ticket. <clears throat> he said, but judge, I don't drive fast. You, you got a picture, you know, uh, the 87-year-old guy. His son was 63. I'm 63, so add 24 years to this face. Judge, I don't drive fast. And he says, well, where, where were you going? What were you doing? I was taking my son to, uh, to the hospital. What's up with your son? You know, and, and how old is he? Well, my son's 63 and, and he's got cancer, and I was taking him there for his cancer treatment. But I, I don't drive fast. And the judge said, You are 83 years old, I mean, 87 years old, and driving your son to the hospital for his cancer treatment? Yes, judge. The judge just kind of grinned and he thought this is just the greatest thing. And he said, I think it's just really good that a dad your age is still taking care of his child. He dropped the charges. You know, that's kind of what God does for us. He, he looks at us and all of our ability and inability and more probably inability at raising kids than than ability, and, and he says, I, I think it's good that you're still taking care of your kids. And he drops the charges. He gives us that kind of grace. Because he knows we love our kids. We might not love them perfectly, but we love our kids. I, I just want to say, if there's any other parenting help that you need, uh, you just ask if it's not anything that I can provide. I, I know that I can at least direct you to uh, some resources. Uh, so whatever it is that you, that you might need today, uh, let us know while we stand and sing. Praise my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest Irish shadow.